My guest today is Nick McCarthy. Nick is a former paratrooper with the 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment, 2 Para, who got out to become a very, very successful um, partner in a company called Argus Europe, a close protection and surveillance training provider, <clears throat> and they're also an operational company. Uh, he has been instrumental to me uh, when I got out in, in my transition and success in Civvy Street. And uh, it really is a genuine, well-meaning uh, individual who, who wants to use his knowledge and experience to help help people out where he can to the best of his ability, which is one of the reasons he came on. We had a great conversation. We went through, talked about a lot of stuff um, about leaving the military, getting a job. A lot of it was uh, private security, surveillance oriented. There's a, a wealth of information there for anyone getting out, deciding um, uh, what they want to do, um, whether that be private security, uh, surveillance or private investigation or, or, or something else. Um, really useful conversation, I felt. I, I learned from it, as I always do from Nick. I, 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 I guess you will too. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, HR with Nicholas McCarthy. We were talking off air, Nick. Mm-hmm. You reminded me of something you you said to me before. We were talking about, um, I think we were on about Leavers Link in Colchester. Yeah. Networking event, right? And <clears throat> we were on, you were on about coming down. Mm-hmm. And uh, I assumed it was to come down and help guys out. I know because now you've got that attitude. People get, guys and girls getting out, yeah, and give you your own experiences. But one of the things you said was you, you'd persuade people to, it actually changed my perspective on things. Actually, when you said it, I thought a lot more about it. You would you wanted to come down and tell people to stay in the military. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think <clears throat> people get out as a knee jerk reaction, and I and I think I said to you, if there's like a hundred people signed off, I think I could speak to them and just give them better awareness of what it's like on you know their uh, expectations of what it's like on the outside may not be reality. And I think I could just sort of convince people <clears throat> to either sign back on or, or to sign back on and maybe some people that might be right for them to do the full stint or for some people just to prepare themselves better for getting out. So sign back on for the time being because there's too many people to get out and they're just not prepared for it. Mm, I, I think uh, I 100% agree with you. I think the p- p- part of the problem with that is, right, you know, persuading them is that when you're in, and you know this, when you start and dislike being in, holy shit, mate. Mm-hmm. It's like, you, you cannot wait to get out. I, I didn't have it that bad. You know, I, I, I sort of, cause I, I was older, I had made a measured approach to it. There were certain yeah. other factors that sort of, did it, you know, hearing and Afghan had finished, well, this sort of the job satisfaction was going. Um, but for someone who's, who's, who's hell-bent on getting out, they fucking hate everything, for yeah. whatever reason, trying to persuade them otherwise. Um, I mean, when you when you left, what, what year did you leave? I left at the end of two thousand and four, something like October. Oh. Was there any moments where you th- we we were you know shortly after you got out and you thought like why the why wasn't I told this before not, I got not out? not then but like so so essentially I I left for a number of reasons. The main reason was you know I'd, I'd injured my back and I wasn't going to be able to continue on the stream. So I was going to end up G Ford probably, which I didn't want. Uh, however, had I known then that I could have uh, attempted to become an army photographer, for example, then I would have done it. But no one told me. I didn't. I didn't even realise it was an option. I didn't realise that they had a selection process that I could have went on. Oh, did I? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and had I been made aware of that, the very least I would have done was to put off signing back on in order to have a go at that. Were you into photography back then? then? Yeah, I've, I've been, you know, uh, I mean, the tale is that on my, uh, probably about my eighth or ninth birthday, I was coming downstairs on Christmas morning expecting to see a BMX, and there was a Ricoh KR10X. <laughs> I'll never forget it. <laughs> so it was a film uh, uh, SLR camera. So my dad was into his photography, so I used to go along with him. He assumed, of course, that that would make a great Christmas present for me, which it did. However, when you put it next to BMX, 
<laughs> there was a slight moment of disappointment there. I don't, I don't mind admitting to. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I did it. I did it at school, sort of developing uh, photographs, uh, you know, wet photography, all that sort of thing. And then when I, I sort of gave it up for for a while, and then when digital photography came around, it sort of rekindled the enthusiasm. Uh, to where now I'm obsessed by it again, completely obsessed by it. Yeah, I I I, I assume because obviously Bryce Bryce business partner, mm. I assume that um the photography element had come as part of getting into it from the surveillance side. When I was incidentally, when I was a, a incidentally whatever the fuck it is, when I was a kid, my my old man's also was was a keen keen photographer, amateur mm. photographer. Is is uh. An old flame of his was um, a, a photojournalist for Time, Time magazine, American, yeah. American last. And uh, one of my birthdays, he wasn't as young as you though, I got a mountain bike on my uh, 9th to 10th. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he gave me, uh, in fact, you know what, it must have been like 98, 99, because I ended up taking this thing to, to, that, to the Iraq invasion in 2003. He gave me an old Canon AE1 program. Mm-hmm. So an SLR film, old school thing, old school. Wind it round, and um, yeah. So I didn't realise that you had that, uh, that love of photography beforehand. Yeah, it is. It is obsessive though when you get into it. Love it. It's like uh, yeah. Love it's it. one of those things that you. I I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. There's a load of books out there. You know, you can get your you can get your baseline information from there. You know, the, mm-hmm. the, the your your relationship between the time and exposure and exposure and um, ISO and all the rest. I can't remember the fucking physiology. But you need trigger time. <laughs> Absolutely. And the, the other thing as well is you've got, uh, you know, you, so you have the exposure triangle, which, is, which is what you're referring triangle. to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then in terms of doing surveillance photography, you kind of, you go against the rules. <clears throat> we're always overexposing or we're underexposing because we're not bothered about the sort of the picture, the image as a whole. It might just be that specific spot that's of interest and everything else might be blown out. Yeah. So you, so, so you you need to go and make your mistakes. Uh, so you overexpose because that area might be dark. Correct. Got you. And, and, and vice versa. If it's somewhere very light, you might underexpose, and so the rest of the photograph looks terrible. But the subject that you're photographing is in complete focus, yeah. and, and and all the rest of it. But yeah, I mean, uh, for me, I just love everything about it. You know, I love the plan and preparation before you go. So I'm checking the the weather. I'm checking my routes. You know, uh, I like I like the physical activity of going to do it. And I like the, the you know capturing an image and coming back and then doing the post process and all the rest of it. So it gives me a, a complete circle. It's like a little mission mm-hmm. to go and do. You know, it gives us a reason to be out there. Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah. What, what about um? What do you think? What do you think about the attitude that uh, th- that post processing is cheating? Yeah, it's always been done. Even when you when you were developing, uh, you know, wet photography. I don't think that, by the way. I just yeah, but well, <clears throat> you dodge and burn. You, you know, you would do, that's what it was called, or, or part of the uh, when you're post processing it in your, with your wet film. And still now in Lightroom, there's still like a dodge and burn tool. It just so happens that some people are very very good at it, and the people that aren't very very good at it don't like the fact that other people are. Uh, okay. But it's a, it's another skill, and it and it's not something I'm fantastic at to be honest it's just enhancing the colors isn't it it's basically yeah. what you're doing which you can do through the film anyway if you're using film back in the day you know? exactly all you're doing is your you know the the, the image you know you, you capture an image and you're taking advantage of the information that's there you're not adding anything in or you know my dad still likes to do it but he he, he does different things so he will now we'll take a family photograph and he'll Put my head on my mother's shoulders, <laughs> I, but I don't like doing stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. But he, he loves doing stuff like that. But um, yeah, it's a it's a pretty harmless hobby. But you know, time consuming. You time consuming. Well, you always up in the mountains, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, we've just been to the lakes for a break between Christmas and New Year, uh, and uh, I, I went out every night and slept out in the hills. <laughs> every night. Uh, first night I didn't. Uh, first night I stayed with the family and uh, had breakfast. <laughs> And then after that, I went out. They went to bed, and uh, and I went out. Walking. Sleep out there so you can get, you get, stay up late, get, and get up early, get the sun sunrise, get, get the sun, sun, sun get the stars, yeah, yeah. get the sunrise, yeah, get the sunrise. Yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, get away from the family. Nah. <laughs> nah, she's, I mean, she's great. You know, I mean, she understands. I just like to do it. <coughs> you know, it's good for me to do that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, right, oh, uh, you got out in 04, mm-hmm. and you went. Well, you ended up going to Sierra Leone, did you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I went out there. So, <clears throat> you know, when you said before, did you have a moment when you, soon after you got out, did you think, certainly not for the first six months, because I left Colchester on the Friday. 
and then I was in Gatwick on the Sunday and I flew out to Sierra Leone. That job, like all good jobs, came about through a connection, somebody I knew, someone serving in the platoon with me. His uncle was X3 Para in X Hereford. And then he said, listen, who's leaving now? I need someone that, you know, with a decent head on the shoulders leaving now to go out there and do this job. I met up with him. He came up with coach to see me. We got on really well. Um, he explained the job to me. And, um, you know, at that time, it was the dash for cash. So there was lots of options out there. So it's not like I had to take that job. It was the start of it, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was, I mean, I took that job on possibly half the money that I could have earned going out to Iraq, to be honest. Well, why that choice then? Because it was a, I mean, not not to sort of uh, talk down the lads that made other choices, but instead of being the rear tail gunner on a convoy, I was the security manager in the diamond mine. Hmm. It was a really hard job. It was very, very involved. It took me out of my comfort zone massively. Um, so it was a massive challenge. And it was still five times a month what I'd been earning as a lance jack and power edge. So it's not like I was hard up. Mm. You know, the money was good. Um, but again, it was an old fashioned job, as I've mentioned several times on on, on our group that, that we're in. There was no nine and three back there. There was uh, 10 days leave in six months. It was a full-time job, just working overseas. Jesus Christ. So That's, that's all right if you're, if you're singly. Which I wasn't. Oh, really? No, I wasn't. No. So, uh, yeah, but it was just an opportunity. It was a good opportunity. It was the best thing I've ever done. And everyone, you know, obviously I'm not going for job interviews now, but w subsequently when I came back from that and I went for other interviews with the likes of CR and so on and, you know, the big four, um... They all said, oh, this is interesting. What have you done here? Because it was something different to what other people had done. Mm. You know? well, why did you Why did you feel out your comfort zone going into the, that kind of role? Because it was a management role? Exactly that. There was, you know, because of the state of the country at that time in Sierra Leone, there was no weapons. So, um... As in, you weren't allowed to carry? Unarmed. Yeah. At that time. When I got in there, it was a funny tale to tell about, uh, to tell about that as well, but... Uh, yeah, so it was essentially um, you you were there, or the security consultant was there to set up the physical security in the mine, and ensure that um, obviously there was nothing going missing from the mine employees. So you know, from the guys literally digging them up right up to the management. All the management team there were locals, but they were all educated in Europe. Some very very clever people, mm. on good good salaries as well. Um, but of course. They had influence, so it was just to make sure that yeah. what was coming out of the hole was going in the safe, was then going to Amsterdam. How much were they getting paid? The, the guys, the, were anyone the workers, the dollar a day. You must have a hard battle there, mate. They were gagging for the jobs. Gagging. So they could rob? So no, 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 just because it was a good job. Compared to what? Well, compared to that, that was it. That was the only job? That was the only job. Right. Everyone wanted to work in the mine. And it's not, you don't think that's because they wanted to rob the diamonds? I suppose, how would they shift them though? No, because out there, well, the, one of the other reasons I was out there is they have uh, what they call illicit mining, dim, uh, illicit diamond mining, even, even. So people would, you would come across the illicit uh, mines and, um, you know, which is basically just people like digging a hole and, and you know, trying to find out, trying to find the diamonds. So we'd go out and do, um, uh, you know, sort of patrols in the jungle and that uh, to try and find these guys. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was good. it was a great job. Hmm. How, come, what, what, how come it came to an end? Um, I mean, I, I probably wasn't going to do 12 months out there because <laughs> that was a hard 12 months. And, yeah, I caught malaria when I was out there. Oh, did you? So everywhere I'd been with Power Edge, I'd never take the malaria tablets. I'd say, I'll take these. <laughs> rubbish or you know that sort of thing I went there I took the malaria tablets and caught malaria <laughs> it was hideous it was hideous <laughs> does, it, does it come back does it, you have, it, have any reactions? allegedly uh, you know the doctor at the time said yes uh, you have malaria uh, when you are old it will come back and kill you I don't know he was just trying to mess with my head or what but that's what he said at the time um, well it, it depends I think it depends on the strain you get oh, doesn't it yeah. some people Some I, I know that a, a friend um, uh I think you may know. A friend, he would have relapses that hit him. But I also think, literally just now thinking, thinking back, he's also going through a bout of alcoholism at the time. And I'm thinking, hmm, 
Which, well, which one was it? I think, well, I'm sure what he said to me, when, you, when you're old and your immune system is low, it will come back. So maybe it's the immune system, maybe ah. it's the drinking, maybe, you know. I don't know, I've never researched it, I probably should have, but I mean, it was, it was hideous. Mm. It was on a drip, it was like, I just have this vague memory of, uh, you know, I've been in the, been in the hospital and, uh, you know, getting dripped up and they put, putting needles into us and, and just had enough about <coughs> us to sort of pick, have a look at the needle to see if it was fresh. And then that's all I remember. The next time I remember, just thought there was all these um, uh, ladies, these nurses sort of had hold of me in the shower, scrubbing me down. Um, yeah. In Sierra Leone? Yeah. What was that hospital like? Hideous. <laughs> Hideous. And this was, you know, I, it, was, it, was, it was the white man hospital, essentially. It was still hideous. And I remember going to the doctors there prior to, prior to going to hospital because obviously I wasn't feeling very well. And there was a sign on the door and it said, I can't remember the exact figures, but it was something like Sierra Leonean, uh, 500 Leones, white man, 50,000. To pay to... Yeah. To... 50,000 still wasn't a lot of money. I can't remember. Again, I can't remember how much it was, but it was yeah. peanuts. So I paid the, paid the 50,000 and I said, I want to be at the front of the queue, mate. <laughs> you know, it was, oh, God. <laughs> I just, I felt, I was dreadful. Yeah, yeah, you know, if there's a cure for it, it needs to be found. Mm. Well, Hideous. the biggest killer of people in the world is our mosquitoes. That's the, the the single creature in the world that kills the most people. The creature is mosquitoes. Nice. Learned that two days ago. Nice. Yeah, they, they, they kill. They kill more. They, that creature kills more people than any other creature in the world. Yeah, really little fucker. Isn't it tiny, mate? Yeah, I, I remember. I remember when I was bitten. I remember, the, you know, um, and I remember doing that. And I think what did it, and I, I'm not medically minded, so I don't know, but I was taking the tablets every day, but I was eating local food, prepared locally. So there was a lot going through us, you know. What, what do you mean? What, what, what influence would that have? Well, like what going through you? Shit. <laughs> Oh, can you can you can it be transmitted? Not transmitted. Can it be transmitted like that? Can it? Well, I'm just assuming that maybe the the tablets I was taking didn't ah, have sorry. time. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, I got you. And got you. Uh, I mean, again, when I when I think back, when I first got there, I was staying in the hotel, and it wasn't a hotel. It was, it was just hideous, really. I'm, I'm not even sure I could do it now, because <clears throat> I just left. So I was I was, you know, at my most robustness. I'd always used to be in being away. I'm not sure I could do it now. Yeah. yeah, not sure at all. Rats in the hotel room. I'd come in. I remember, I sort of, I, t- I took my, uh, you know, my running shorts and my my trainers and that out there. And I come back from the mine one day and I lifted my running shorts up and there was a there was a rat sat in one of my trainers. Oh God! And I was like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I knew, oh God! Yeah, I don't think I could do it now. I went out to Uganda when I was still serving, and we, we uh, I, d- I don't remember being too bad. Uh, but, but we were like in the jungle for weeks, and then when we were out of the jungle, we stayed at it's got a mega famous name the barracks, the barracks in Ginger, J I N J A in Uganda. Like a, apparently, it's like a backpacker. If you go to backpack across Africa, that's you go to Ginger, one of the places you go. And uh, what was the name? I'm of trying the... not to crack an obvious joke. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> and what was the name of the barracks? I can't remember what the name of the barracks the English name of some English guy. Uh, but the barracks is all right. But I don't. I, I. But the only horror story I heard involved the hospital, and someone got mega, mega, mega ill. And when they came back, I mean, they were on death door. Like, and when they came back, their main concern was how hideous the hospital was. Yeah. And funny enough, the mos- just mosquito bites getting bitten to fuck. Mm. And once you'd like got out of the the, the the death door kind of thing, he was then worried about am I going to get fucking malaria? Mm. I think the hospital he went to that was Kenya. Mm-hmm. But that, that makes sense. You can look anyway. Mm. So when you, what did you do after you came back from there? Then um, did you have something lined up straight away? No. Um, so came back and and again, you know, that job really was great foundations. And I came back from there, and because the dash for cash was in full flow, um, I'd said to Michelle, I said, "Listen, there's a gap in the market in the UK now." Because there's been a, a you know an exodus of people that work in the the UK circuit, and I and I said, listen, you know, I, th- I think I've got an opportunity to to get in where perhaps in the past I wouldn't have, but that will mean potentially hard times, hard financial times, you know. So I, I could go to Iraq, 
and uh, and I'm sure at the time it was sort of eight and a half, nine thousand pound a month out there at that time, which is a lot of money to turn down, you know. <laughs> I said, oh, I can, I can, uh, I can see if I can make it go over in the UK. Fortunately, Michelle has got a, a really good job, and so you know, financially, she, you know, we, we sort of were okay. And so I just decided that I wanted to do surveillance, which was born from the fact that I love to do photography. And um, I just started writing uh, emails to people. Dear sir, you know, please find attached. Three months of nothing, not even a bounce back email or not even an email to say, mate, you're not inter- we're not interested, you're not qualified, you're not experienced, you've got nothing about you, you know, go and do something else. At which point I was seriously thinking, have I made the right decision here? You know, um, I then started to make tentative inquiries about going out to the likes of Iraq, uh, at which point it hit a slight downturn. So that there was a, you know, a resounding no there. Um, <coughs> and then I got one response from a, a local private investigator who said... Um, I've had a look at your CV. I'm an ex-policeman. I've uh, I've showed a colleague of mine who's an ex-soldier. He said that you know you've you've got a decent CV. I've got work on next week. There's no budget for three, but if you'd like to come along, I'll cover all your expenses. I can have a look at you. You can have a look at me, and we'll see where it goes. Mm. Got to the end of the week, and he said, right, yeah, you know, I, I like you. Um, here's a list of equipment I'd like you to go and buy in the short term to to, to get you by, and I'll give you some work. And I've never missed a day's work since. So it was a copper and bright. No, it was uh, someone else. It was somebody else who uh, do you remember Glenn from the course Scottish? Yes, fella? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Glenn w- was doing some work with this um, this guy called Ken Mason, who was the uh, the policeman, great guy, still in touch with him, and uh, and then Glenn introduced me to Brian. Ah. So as I, you know, it's just as I got into their little fold that that then Glenn thought, oh well, he's okay. And, and Brian must have said to Glenn, we need someone. Do you know anyone that's available? And then that just flourished from there. Yeah. You mentioned that you measured got a time about <clears throat> dash for cash kind of things. And, mm. and I'm, I think people, Tom's, Lance Jack's flipping out even screws at this moment in time, will not even have a clue what we're on about, right? They won't when you say dash for cash. Because it's, it's interesting, this, this popped in my head there, I think. It, so it was that, you know, CP kicked off in, mm. in Iraq, CP work, and like you say, eight, nine, ten thousand pounds sterling a yeah. month. Mega bucks, man. On, on an eight and four, a yeah. nine and three, yeah. paid Mega on bucks. leave, great yeah. stuff. Mega bucks. Living like flipping rock stars. Mm. Um, but that money has dwindled, cut like majorly, as you know. Some people are on like 150, flipping $120 a day. Yeah. But it's, it's, but the peculiar thing is that that positive light on going out to the Middle East and doing CP work has stayed there with the like with the guy. It's still like a yes, yeah, good. it's like a, yeah, get out the circuit and get out get out a mega bucks. Even though no, 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 yeah, like five, six years ago maybe seven years ago, eight years ago maybe, but not now. But that that attitude is still there. I think it, it is a a good move. I don't think it is a good move. I do not think it is a good move. I don't. Think, I think it's a gap filler. Yeah. If needed, at best, at best. But it's a flipping vortex. I mean, I always say to the guys that come on our courses, if you want to go and do that, and, and you need to tick that box to to sort of uh, get it out of your system, you should start with the end in mind. Mm. What is it you want to achieve by going out there? Do you want to pay your mortgage off? Do you want to get a deposit for a mortgage? Uh, you know, do you uh, just want to get yourself set financially if you've left the army with a load of debt, for example? Which you shouldn't do, but... You know, so it's a short term. It's a short term thing for most people, not for everybody. No, it should be a short term thing for most. It's not, I don't think. Um, you should define short term though. I think for most people, it should be a two to three year gig. Okay, right. okay. But for those people that progress, and there are people that do progress. Yeah. I mentioned Chris Shaw to you. Yeah. Chris has progressed. You off that out there. Yeah. Yeah, as I, a result of that. Yeah, and if that's yeah, if that's yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have a plan. I mean, but the, um, part of the, uh, so part part problem with that is is that, uh, is the perception of how valuable that experience in being the C, being doing the, the private security stuff being in the CP world in the Middle East, 
how much weight that holds in terms of getting a a sustainable long-term job. It holds very little weight, unless, like you're saying, well, in my eyes, mate, even Ops Manager, a big fucking deal. This is no, de- I do not mean this in detriment to like the Ops Managers out there. That is a hard job, don't mm. get me wrong. But the fact of the matter is, you come back to the UK, okay? It doesn't hold any water. I, it, pff, very little, very little. I mean, a lot of my decisions, but a reason I am where I am now, almost entirely those decisions that I made when I was out in the circuit, I, honestly, a lot down to yourself and the advice mm. you gave me. Um, over the, over the time, which I appreciate and thank you very much, you know, um, which which put that into my head. Well, uh, l- watch your long term, look at their options, um, and not just look at other options. What that you're doing now has opened up some options that you maybe can't see, like uh, you know, like health and safety. I ended up going to health and safety. I would never thought of doing that unless mm. it's co- because of the conversation you, you know I had at the time, um, and it, uh, so. So you think well uh, health and safety security well yeah you're protecting people it's the same fucking thing it's the same thing you're protecting people is it what it is yeah. saving li- I, I, I used to joke when I was when I was doing health and safety manager roles. I'm, sa- I'm saving fucking lives don't complain about that near miss report I'm saving lives <laughs> but it's it's identifying that next sort of um, you know that uh, sort of emerging skill set that people need I was having a chat with uh, one of the guys recently and I said you know and I managed to help facilitate them into a job, get them an interview. And then it's obviously starting the, the the individual. And I said, you know, what what are you doing? And he said, oh, well, a bit of CP, a bit of RST. And, uh, and I said, right, so you're looking after people and you're looking after people in buildings. He said, yeah. And I said, well, wh- what are you thinking of doing next, you know, in order to sort of move, move yourself along? And he said, oh, I don't know, I'm struggling a bit. I was going to get in touch with you. And I said, well, have a look at things like business resilience, and like disaster planning for, for businesses because whoever you're working for, you know, that the family will be getting older, the need for that one-on-one guy will reduce, but they've still got a business that's still going to have to be robustly secured in some way. So if you can be the guy that knows more of facilities management because they own lots of things and they all need securing and looking after so just don't be the one trick pony. Don't go and do the, uh, oh God, the fast driving course, because no one's really interested. Mm. Yeah, money, money best spent elsewhere, isn't it? Yeah. Um, another, another nugget you gave me, and then I ended up doing, and I think, which is probably, in fact, the fact that I started doing it was, was critical. It became critical to me being able to come back to the UK and find a job in the UK. And that was uh, networking, mm. right? But, so, but, how do you do that when you're out in the sandpit? So what, what, I, what I did was I set myself, when I decided, right, I need to try it, I need to try coming back to the UK and it's going to be a couple of years because it takes that long, right? Mm. I was out in the pit for four years in the end. But what I would do is, again, it's that sacrifice. And you were talking about financial sacrifice, financial hard times. When you come, I was on an eight and four most of the times out there. In fact, all the times out there. In reality, that's like a eight and three and a bit, really, when you take travel off. And I made the commitment that I would come back and I would try and do at least one job, security, yeah, for anyone. On my leave, at least one job. Mm-hmm. And I'd always be reliable. Reliability is key, as you would always say, right? Um, so if I said I was going to do something, I'm flipping doing it, job-wise. Uh, my wife at the time said, okay, you know, that needs to be done. Well, that's what we're doing. Not, I didn't give her much of a choice, like, <laughs> that's what was happening. And, but through doing, man, I did some absolute toss jobs. I, it, the other thing was, when that reliability thing comes in, sometimes when a job comes in, and it's like, right, well, come and do this for two days. And I did one, come and do this for two days, and it was staggering on, right? Was stagging on a um, a a waste a, 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 a chemical a chemical waste no 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 yeah a chemical waste facility in Barking in East London right um, high vis jacket eyes on a night shift as a new guy quite for about a, quite a big security company and uh, I met it for two days that was and I was I couldn't afford to stay down it wasn't worth it to go and uh, have a hotel or anything down there. I didn't have a mates in that area, so I was getting the train down 
So this, my plan was get the train down early, mo- uh, no, sorry, uh, in the afternoon with a bike. I'd get off, I think it was West Ham, I think it was, I can't remember, I'd get off and I'd cycle, because it was cheap, I'd cycle <laughs> then cross country to the next overground instead of taking the underground. Then I'd get all back on, I'd get back off my bike, it's like a two hour, two and a half hour commute, right? I'd cycle in about five miles in the middle of it, get the bike and do stag on, then come back in the morning home to sleep. Because I, I we only had one car at a time, the missus needed the car, it was just like fucking hell. It turned into a 10 day task. Mm-hmm. Do you want to, can you do an extra day? Can you do an extra day? Reliability is key, right? So mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus it was cash. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not cash. Plus it was money, skyrocket, extra money. Mm-hmm. Yes, 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 yes. It's 10 days, mate. 10 days gone out of three weeks. But the people, so yes, staggering on, hybrid's vest. There were some morons on the team. There were some brilliant people. But the networking value that I had, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter how basic the job is. Like, I know you agree with this because don't sure. be a job snob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it doesn't matter how how menial or shit you think the task is. One is putting money in your pocket. Two, all right, you're only meeting guys who's, who's stagging on, but they've got the same intentions as you, or you, they, they meet you. You are doing a job well. You'd like to think professional. You're likable, in, not likable. You, you can hold a conversation with someone. If everything about you is positive, the very worst that can happen is if you fall in hard times a year, two years down the line, you can go yo, to the company, yeah. Uh, and then going or ring up one of those guys who you did well with or you know he did the job with he's, he flipping didn't fall asleep stag he had a comment yeah he got on with mate you know we weren't going that, but that's the very worst that can happen you've got something to fall back on yeah. because especially in the security world man what a rough ride it is it is one of the most unstable industries i've ever been a part of it is yeah. the most unstable industry i've ever been a part of you know to the point i would never want to be a part of it again it's just that was my experience uh, alone i don't know I'm, I'm, yeah. What 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 do you what do you think about it? I think uh, I mean I, you know I, I I do agree with 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 your viewpoint on 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 those sort of jobs. I mean one thing uh, I don't know if uh, Brian mentioned it the the job we had a hand in recently with the uh, open cast mine. One thing I realised with that job is that good people do a good job on relatively poor money, like they would on really good money, and those that are just poor people do a crap job on crap money and good money. Mm. There were some really experienced guys dug out for us. We were paying, we were paying the lads £100 a day, £700 a week. We were paying 30 of them, £700 a week, mind. Um, and uh, there were some really good lads with loads of experience there who dug out blind on that 100 quid a day. And there were some lads there that had no experience who really should have dug out blind who did like a really bad job. So when a really good job comes in along, comes along, I'm just not clearly. I'm not going to go to those guys and mm-hmm. say, "Oh, here you go." Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it was a real eye opener that. Mm-hmm. You know, guys that didn't need the money that went up there to do a job to help us out to do us a favour, and um, it was it was it was a great job to be part of. Mm. Even though no one earned particularly great money from it, we didn't earn good money from it really. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, and the guys didn't, but it filled a gap for people. Yeah, but you say that, Nick, hundred pound a day. When I was a screw or a sergeant, it was yeah. seventy quid a day. Yeah, yeah. Do you know well, what I, mean? I look at it like that, and you do, but most people, most people don't. Oh, I don't get out of bed for less than hundred and fifty quid. Yeah. Well, good fucking luck. But uh, exactly. going back to what I was saying about it, so that doing work in between, the, the point I was coming on to, doing that work in between the Ritic. But I mean, that ten days it broke me. Mm. I was fucked. I was, I was, I was getting out. You know, time you travel back to Colchester, mine from Barking. Mm-hmm. I was only get a few hours sleep. Plus. When you're on leave, I, I, I've got kids. So I mm-hmm. want to spend time with my kids. I, don't, you feel, I felt super guilty. I wasn't spending time with them, but at the same time, I didn't want to let the, the people down on the task. And, but, so over those two years of doing that, yeah, a year or two years of doing that, there was a point where, I was like, right, in order for me to try and secure a job, I need to, in the UK, I need to come back. I need to go out, hit people, you know, Perth face-to-face, do the job applications, do the CV, but also get a network. Just hammer it, hammer it, hammer it, hammer it. Spend however long it's going to take to do that. And like, I, I reckoned I had um, like three months worth of, oh shit, they're saving money. I reckoned I had like three months of being able to do three months without without earning money. So like three months to try and secure a job. Mm-hmm. Um, but because I'd done all those tasks in between, as soon as I came back and made the decision, right, pulling the pin and said, I'm not going back out of the pit and try and find a job, I was able to do those calls and go, and it literally, well, like I said, some people only worked for once mm-hmm. and they've been ages before. 
any work going? Any work going? Any work? And, and, and I, you know, I got some of them I got work from, and some of them there wasn't anything going. Mm-hmm. Um, kept me ticking over to be able to get a job. And and similar to what you had, mate, I, I reckon I sent out, I reckon I made about, got to be well over 200 applications. Mm-hmm. Well over 200 applications. I got, out of that 200, I got two interview opportunities. Uh, and they were also the only two responses I got. You know, uh, so to go on your point about you don't get reply, that pisses people off. But you got to bear in mind, some of these jobs, it's like a thousand people applying. Yeah. The recruiter, you, you, you'll you probably get an automated reply these days. You ain't going to get a fucking uh, a personal reply. It's just, the way, it's just the way it happens. Yeah. It's the way it happens. I mean, I think uh, when people make that sacrifice like you did, again, there's a way to approach that. When you've got working <coughs> kids and, uh, you know, I try and pass as much of this on as I can during the course because the one thing you've got to have is a good relationship in this industry because if you haven't, mm. it's done. You know, you, you, you will end up divorced. It's, it, it is a marriage killer, the industry, as you know. And um, <laughs> I wasn't the industry, did it? <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> may have contributed along the line, but I always say to people, listen, if you're going to come back and you're going to do work in between, you know, say to, say to the missus or the, the other mister or however it is, listen, I'm going to go and do this work. This is the reasons why I'm going to earn this much money for it. We'll use that money for the next leave to pay for a holiday so that he or she can then see the value of what you're doing. You're not do, you know, you're working abroad, so you don't need the money per se, but you're going to use that money to pay for a holiday for you and the kids to go mm. away with. And, that, and that's, how, that's what I do. So I do things now that... That you know that that I don't need the the, the money for, but I but I'll say to Michelle, listen, you know we'll uh, we'll we'll I'll go and do that, and then I'll get that money. We'll pay it straight off the mortgage. You, you know, so we can see a a, a sort of. Uh, so, but what's the point of going and doing it then? Well, f- for me, yeah, because I might be doing it to maintain a business relationship. Sorry, okay, got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you know, so I did. Yeah. I did some work in uh, Bradford, um, but over Christmas when I was off. And I just had to go and do it because I've got a key relationship with those people and they needed it done. Yeah. So. Yeah, 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 yeah got you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because what will happen is if I don't go and do it, four months down the line when maybe I do need the money, they've gone elsewhere. Mm. You know, they, they're coming to me because they've got a problem. They're not coming to me because, you know, they're like uh, the clothes I wear. They come to me because I'm effective in what I do. But they've got a problem. They need a solution. Mm-hmm. And they need it sorted. And that's it. Mm. Friendships go so far, but ultimately, people want the job done. Yeah, 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 got you. Mm. How do we get into that? Don't know. Uh, possibly you, you know, uh, coming home on leave and uh, and doing some work. Oh no, you were on about when you you, you, you came back from Syria. Mm. Yeah. So pick up from there then. You met you met you met, the, you met Glenn. Met and Glenn. you met um, the copper. No, Glenn yeah. was the copper, wasn't he? No, no. So Glenn, Glenn was in uh, one of the Scottish regiments. Uh, uh, it, it never struck me as ex-military. Yeah, he left as a, <laughs> uh, an RQ or something. Okay. Or, uh, something there. So um, he basically rang me up and said, "Listen, there's some work going um, for for this uh, this fella uh, called Brian, and we've got an RV tomorrow morning." Uh, and I can remember, I can remember it so well. You know, and uh, the last thing he said to me uh, was, "Get an early night, be there early, and make sure you've got your own all the, all the kit you need because this bloke doesn't mess about." So uh, it was uh, it was in an Asda car park we met, and uh, he sort of sort of bright sort of marches along type of thing. You know, he moves with a purpose at all times, and uh, so he came up to me and he said, "You're the new bloke." Didn't say good morning, nothing like that. I said, "Yeah." He goes, right, you can make every single mistake in the book once. He says, if you make the same mistake twice, you can fuck off. <laughs> he said, I'm sick and tired of people turning up <coughs> and being shit. If you're any good, I've got 20 to 25 days work every month. If you're shit, I'll not see you by the end of the week. And walked off. <laughs> like that. Oh. <laughs> Great. I then rang him up and I said, have you got a brief sheet? He said, I don't do brief sheets. <laughs> write anything down listen carefully and then he briefed us on the task <laughs> <laughs> that was it good things have come from that though I've now had to uh, you know uh, I have I have made sure that I now have a good memory I retain lots of information which causes problems when I'm not working because I find it hard to calm down and calm down um, but he made everything a challenge not to be an arse 
um, just to lift my game. Mm. So he, he wouldn't recognise that he's been this, but he's been a massive mentor to me, but in a not a particularly formatted way. But do you think intent is... is sorry, sorry to interrupt there, mate. Do you think with uh, making everything a challenge to up your game, do you think an intentional thing or just the way he is? As in- it's it's the way he is. He, he doesn't compromise. And and that and I'm not saying that's a bad thing because we're working here, you know, we're, we're, we're working, we're, it's got to be right. Um, I think I think he probably took a shine to us. Um, you know, I was one of those and I was the same in the movie. I was, I was always... First there, I was always a bloke that had two of everything. So if someone broke a spoon and when we were away, I've got a spare one, mate. You know, that was me. So we'd be turning up in jobs and people like, oh, you got any tapes? Like, yeah, I've got some. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? I, I was always that bloke that had a spare something. And and it was the same with, with all this sort of stuff. So when I, you know, when I got on the team, his team, you know, there was guys there, there was ex-deck guys, ex-box guys, a lot, and then there was me, you know, and I knew nothing. And um, so a couple of days in, he said, like, what is your surveillance experience? I said, I haven't got any. So I was in two power patrols, so I've got green OP experience. Um, uh, you know, I'm pretty good with the camera, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, right, just sit there and do exactly as I tell you and do nothing else. <laughs> um, and then several months down the line, we're driving back from a job <clears> and, uh, co- you know, c- comes over the radio, you know, uh, bravo, Mike. Yeah, Mike send my house tomorrow morning, eight o'clock, surveillance training. And that, and that, and that, you know. So you did a, a bunch of months of just doing what he fucking told you. Static, uh, static OP is given a standby. Ah, yeah. ah, right, yeah. right standby. Right, tough right, one right. out. Yeah, towards Bravo One. That's Alpha One. Compute Bravo One. And that's Bravo One. Uh, mobile towards Red Two. And and then he'd ring me up and say, right, get the Sunderland. Boom. <laughs> but that was the right thing to do. That is the right way to do it. What, what do you mean? In what, what, what we got? Not so. I wasn't getting involved with stuff that I, I didn't know about the nice. mobile, the mobile follow. So I wasn't getting involved. He didn't put me put me in a position to fail, because I would have. He just slowly bled me into it. Yeah. So when I did my resettlement course, we didn't, you know, we didn't do anything like what ours is really. Um, and I say to the guys now they do the course. You're so lucky that you know that. That you know, you're actually out doing this because I didn't. I didn't get to do it. You did a surveillance course, did you? I did a CP course. It had a little bit of surveillance in it, but it was you know looking back wasn't great, mm. to be honest. Um, and you, you know, it's a hard thing to learn in the seven days that we do that we that we um, introduce people to it for. But that's all it is, and we say that it's an introduction. We can't turn you out to be a surveillance. Operator, whatever you want to call yourself in seven days, it is impossible. And I'll say to people on every course, it took me 18 months or thereabouts of working every day with him and with others, six days a week, uh, before I felt I was part of the team or an asset to the team. I'm not saying I was crap from day one up to the 18 month point, um, but I used to come home at times and say to Michelle, you know, I'm struggling, I am really struggling here. This is, you know, this isn't easy. Um, and then it just it just started to click, you know, and it was just like, you know, it, it's it's something that I do feel that I am good at, and um, it just started to click, and he put he put time into us, you know, hmm. and I had lots of uh, trigger times, you put it, because uh, I was doing at least 20 days every month, working different jobs with different people. He would introduce me to other people and say, right, uh, Keith's got some work on, there's no one for me next week, go and work with him for a week. And, you know, I've got some pearlers from Brian, words of wisdom that I'll, you know, that have sort of really resonate with me now. And he'll say, look at what I do, look at what Harry does, look at what Glenn does, pick out all the good parts and put them together. So Glenn takes excellent video. Uh, Harry was a great mobile surveillance operator. Brian's command and control is brilliant. You know, I just try to, I just, just to listen a lot and try and piece it all together mm. and put the good parts of it, everyone's together. Mm. And that's that's sort of what's worked for me. Was it um, was Argus just uh, operational at the time, not training? Yeah, at that time. I mean, he'd always done elements of training for different clients and been involved in like short term training tasks and what have you. But how we came to get into the training was the people that I did my course with basically rang me up after um, after I'd been back in the UK for a while and said, "Listen, you're local." We need some help. Can you come along? 
I went along, I helped them out for one course. I said, this is a disaster. I can't uh, fill the boots that need to be filled here, but I know a man that can. I introduced Brian to them. We did it together. They still, they were, had they been willing to invest, we probably just would have stayed with them, but they weren't. So we just said, this is our last course. And we left and we just set up on our own. Mm. What year was that? It would have been about uh, 2008. Did you, let me just take this hoodie off. Um, mm. uh, did you, um, I'm assuming then your first, your first students were a bunch of your mates from Tupac. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, we started off, uh, they, they've only really started to come through in the last few years because my peer group is obviously reaching their 22 year point now. Right, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, no, we, uh, I mean, God, we started off with like threes, you know, running courses. Again, running courses really at a loss. Running courses at very small profit because that's what you've got to do when you start a business up in a lot of cases, you know. And uh, the reputation just sort of grew from there. And then I guess um, different conflicts around the world accelerated that, you know, the need for people, you know, when Phoenix went from, you know, went from running courses with eight on to running them with 30 on mm. stuff like that so then you know a lot of the training providers did well and and now it's gone back to the, the, the state where there's not as many anymore which is probably the right place for it to be and uh, not as many training providers oh okay oh, is it a lot less now is there yeah there is yeah is there i, I don't know I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm i've not got a good handle on it at the minute is it? i mean I, I don't i don't check you know i don't look at other people's websites i don't check what anyone else is doing but just there, there are just people get reduced or taken off the list that just down to less demand uh i think it's less demand and you know the boxes to tick are quite extensive as a training provider that what we have to um fulfill our end oh really oh what is it it's changed over time then i take it yeah massive what's it now then well we get the same inspections that uh, that newcastle college would get Go on, give me an example. I did not know this. Give me an example. This is from the SIA. No, no. I mean, the SIA really have nothing, nothing to do with this. At Excel. It's uh, it's your awarding bodies, and it's the uh, the military, the uh, enhanced learning credits, and it's the um, oh, what do you call them? Uh, the uh, CTP. Yeah, we've got we've got a whole cool. whole list of boxes to tick. I I didn't know that, mate. Mm. How often do you get so? Well, they'll, they'll come out and they'll they'll look at uh, all the feedback that we get. They uh, look at uh, your quality manual to make sure your processes and your systems and uh, your data protection. It, 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 I mean, it's monstrous. We've got a pre-inspection uh, on the thirtieth of January. We've then got the follow-up inspection about uh, two weeks later in February. Uh, so we every course gets inspected once a year without fail, a visit, and that's from every awarding body. Mm. Um, and we get the MOD visit us once a year. I mean, we welcome all these inspections. You can't hide. They will sit down and say, show me your. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you might get a, like you might give uh, the guys in your section ins- uh, an inspection before you go to the jungle. Same as, show me your. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? They doorstep you. So you'll be coming in, uh, you know, and any day you're training, you've got to submit your training program. They will doorstep you and arrive to make sure you're doing it. The person that is teaching it is teaching it. Where you've said you're teaching it, they'll then ask for your risk assessment on the activity that you're carrying out. Check it out. That's well, good, though. It's, I, it, it's the way it should be. Do you remember all the... Uh, I, I'm just remembering back now. You've prompted memories, man. I remember the, 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 I remember being out in the pit. It must have been the first six months, I think, I was out in the pit. And the, the requirement changed from being first aid at work the requirement yeah, of the CP yeah. um, FPOS to FPOS and I was I, I could have paid money to someone to give me my FPOS certificate without me even setting foot in the door you know we, we get it all the time and you, you you just you can't accept that you can't and the other thing that happens in the industry is a lot of people now you know we get phone calls every week did your blogs attend your course between these dates because we've got a certificate here and it doesn't look right and some of the lads have lied. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the med courses are the, are the, are the ones where people fabricate Oh, uh, really? It's not worth it to us to do it. 
and it isn't worth it to that individual either because yeah. then they're because then they're a liar. Yeah, this is a, um, this is a, one of the thing when I when I was um, when I uh, I've done a few like recruitment recruitments, and one of the when when we were sort of setting up the the initial okay how how are we going to vet go, what's the program going to be you know from 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 firing out the ad to choosing who we want to work with and one of the you know obviously one of the parts is you go through the CVs do the CV sift and um and I said right the part this is going to be we check they got what we need but then yes it's going to be time consuming and I mean could it isn't practical when you're doing big regular recruitments but we weren't doing that at the time I said but the other thing is every qualification they say they've got on there we check every single qualification even if it's not relevant yeah the point being if one of those is bullshit yeah. That ain't the kind of guy you want, or girl you won't work with you. Mm-hmm. You won't work with you. And um, you see, you know, you ring up the provider and go, did such and such a people? Yeah. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. And like yeah, you said, mate, pe- people, 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 bullshit. It's just not. It is. Oh God, why would you do it? I but beggars beggars belief. Man. I don't. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I mean, people just you know. CVs, you know, you so you people send a CV in there and it's it's got all the bullet points and they're another one that constantly let people down. What the, the, the bullet points? Well, just just CVs in, in general because what a lot of people do is they'll, they'll copy their friend's CV mm. and it'll say it will describe their friend perfectly, but it won't describe them perfectly. But they mm. have, then they don't change it. They, they they might have down. Well, one of the best ones, and again, one of the examples given the course is this: I interviewed this guy. Um, and it said one of his bullet points was an expert in counter surveillance. Now, I'm not an expert in anything. And it would have been better for him to say knowledge of, knowledge in, experience of. But he said an expert. And I said, okay, I said, that's fantastic. An expert in counter surveillance. I said, can you describe to me what counter surveillance is? And he described it incorrectly. Mm. And I said, mate, that, that, that isn't counter surveillance. He then disagreed with me, which is absolutely fine. But he was wrong. Mm. It'd be I would I would never have um, pursued him had he said experience of. Mm-hmm. But he's not an expert, mm-hmm. so it's a small word, but it means such a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Badly chosen bullet point didn't get the job. Mm. CVs CVs are a fucking nightmare, aren't they? Nightmare. Mm. I think once you um, you have to resign yourself, not resign yourself to the fact you have to acknowledge. That um, the the CV is will always be a work in progress. Work in progress, and you and I could look at the same CV and I could think I like that, and you could look and go don't like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and you could look at it right, at your own CV, and go yeah, happy with that. Yeah. Then a month later, and you might not have gained any experience like work wise in there. No need to change it. Go back and look at it. and Go fucking. Hell. It is. It's perception. It's perception of it. I, I, I'm I'm of the I'm of the opinion that, for that reason, what you said, that um, there's certain things that you should never, ever, 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 ever put in a CV. Ever, ever, ever. Such as? Photo, address, photo, address, date of birth, unless it's asked for. Well, address should never go on for two reasons. Per sec. Mm -hmm. And um, you may discount yourself from a job Mm -hmm. by being geographically in the wrong place. Yeah. Uh, It may be appropriate on a CV to say... Located within within the M25, it may be appropriate to say located within an hour of London. There are exceptions, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's never appropriate to put your CV on. Uh, to sorry, to put your address on the CV. People flip and do it, mate. Um, um, I think I think with CVs, what people don't do is they don't read the advert and make adjustments accordingly. But why do you think that is, though? Why do I think they don't read the advert? No, why do you think they don't make adjustments? Um, I just think it's a lack of attention to detail. Or you find out 200 applications, mate. Yeah. You think about it. When I, I don't know what it was for you. When I was, when I was jobbing, and I'd be doing 10, 15, 20 applications a day. Easily, easily. You can't, it's impractical to make the adjustment. But what I did have was I had, I think I had three or maybe two different CVs, okay? I, and they were, they were pointing at different things. Yeah. I had one that's health, safe, health, safety, uh, health, safety, security, facilities management, that kind of corporate health, safety, security, it's all the same fucking thing, right? And then I had one that was security-orientated. They, they were worded differently. Same qualifications, same experience, 
you know, uh, but just would have definitely pointed in a different direction. And that's exactly what you should do. And then from there, you can, it, it wouldn't take a lot of effort to cut and paste something. You know, I, I always say to people, you should have a hostile orientated CV, a UK orientated one. You should have, if you've got the background, a management orientated one, maybe a training orientated one if you spent, you know, because if you're applying for a role uh, as a, you know, in a training, as a training role, you should highlight your experience as a trainer. Mm-hmm. And and the, the, other, the other big mistake that everybody makes is the personal profiles. They all read the same. And once you've read 15, you stop reading them. I, 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 never, I, never, I never read them. Oh, I, 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 because I, 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 I think the only, po- only stage, so in those recruitments, it, the only stage that I read those was I was down to the final bunch of CVs that we were mm. probably going to choose from or invite in. Because up to that point, because like you say, it's usually fucking bollocks. It's ve- they're very, very difficult to write. Very difficult to write. Because there's a million different ways you write it. How do you know? It's, it's like the whole CV, really. You deliberate over, oh my God, have I, got the, have I got the order of the sections in the right way? You know, is my name right there? You know, should I put my email address in the foot there? Or should I just put it on the foot? It's all, and the same with the, you know, same with the, the, the personal... Or the professional profile, I think they call it at the top, isn't it? Oh, we, there we go. Personal profile, professional profile. I, I, you know, my, my, my understanding. Well, the way I do it, and the way I advise is, it's no more than six lines, and and it should be a summary of your CV. But then, how difficult is that to do? What do you summarise? How look at mission information of the CV? It's, yeah. you know, it's flipping epic. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, and I know that we disagree over uh, professional CV writers. Do we? Go on. I didn't think you approved. Uh, no, I do approve. I do approve. So you are talking about getting someone else to write your CV for yeah. you. I think the best option is for you to write it. If you're not capable of doing it, you know, which is which is fine. Not everybody is. People have different strengths, right? Get a third party to do it. However, you need to get that CV back and know it inside out. 100%. Inside, uh, I think... I think you showed me a CV as someone I know, <laughs> right? Uh, or did you? Oh, no, 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 no. Bollocks. Yeah. Right, so I got a job application from someone, and I was working on the pit, um, working with a couple of mutual friends, actually, on the contract there. And we got an application. I don't think the guy who applied knew that we were the guys who were reading the CVs. And this application came in, and uh, I read through it. And... Um, got down to the thing and I went what and he had this guy in his experience military experience had cited uh, a job that he never did but what's more I did it <laughs> <laughs> at the time he was saying mm-hmm. you know at the time he was how did I get to that crap then oh sections and I said yeah 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 how did I get to that and so at the time he was saying yeah but fucking mental photos mate Look, have I told you about well, never mind the photo and the CV. Listen, listen to this. Listen to this. Well, I, in fact, no. I can see the face you put in. The reason I say don't put a photo on the CV. So the reason there are three things I said, never put them on. Unless there's certain situations in place. Absolutely. Apply for a job in London, you happen to live inside the M25 belt. Fucking right, put it on there. If it's in the Outer Hebrides and you happen to live in the Outer Hebrides, well, you're probably going to get that job if you live in the Outer Hebrides, right? But the reason I say is because they're all the address, so your location, even just town or city, right? Leave it off there. Photo, leave it off there. What was the other one? Address, photo, something else. Address, photo, come the other thing, right? Is because they are things that don't have to go on, and they are things that people will make assumptions on, right? And they so let's take a photo as a classic example, right? I had a I had a photo on. I had a photo on my CV. I don't blame you for I, not putting one on you. <laughs> <laughs> I had a photo on my CV, right? And. Um, Right, so the best case is of having a photo on, someone looks at the photo, because they will see it. You've drawn, you've drawn imagery over text. The first thing someone's going to see is that photo, right? Yeah. They can, how many times have you looked at a picture of someone, and you, I'll say every time, you make an assumption based on what they're wearing, or based on what colour the hair there is, what colour what color skin they are, the kind, the kind of look they seem to have on their face, whether mm-hmm. their lips are pursed or not, right? So the best case scenario you can have from having your photo in your CV is someone looks and goes, That's pos- uh, they have a positive reaction to it he looks professional or she looks professional or um oh they're wearing a suit good or their hair you know whatever the worst case scenario of a photo on your on your on your cv is a negative impact right he looks like a prick 
Why mine was like me stood in the garden gazing. It wasn't even straight on, right? It wasn't like a head and shoulder thing. Yeah, you know, it's uh, he looks a bit pretentious or whatever, right? If you don't have the photo, and you, bear in mind this is assuming they have an after photo. If you don't have the photo in your CV, the worst case scenario is there is no worst case scenario. It's neutral. You can neither have the positive or the negative. There's, you can't have people just like um, make assumptions and discriminate. And why is he wearing a blue tie? Must be conservative. <laughs> it, I don't would, don't I risk mean, it. Don't risk the negative. I would say. I would say probably don't put one on, but but everybody needs to have a head and shoulders yeah. and a full length good to go. Yeah. Because someone will read your CV and go, "I like them. <coughs> I like the sound of them. Get us his photo. Get us her photo." And then people will make assumptions and. What I'll say to people now is get a photograph taken uh, stood in front of a door. Because from when you're stood in front of the door, people can then assess your height and your girth. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't matter what the CTP tell you or, or anyone else. Fat people don't get work mm -hmm. at the highest levels in this industry. End of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can be a thin, good-looking idiot and get a job. If you're a fat genius, you're going to struggle. Yeah. Well, I mean, because, because there you go, people make assumptions about what, what you kind of lifestyle you are, kind of person you are, rightly or wrongly, mm. rightly or wrongly. Plus, there's certain physical attributes you need to be able to fucking have. Um, well, I got sent a, so on the same, in the same CV sift as I had that, that, that uh, um, CV that said this guy did the job I was doing at the same time in the same unit. Mm. <laughs> we had another one in, and one of the things he requested was a full length photo, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was with Kazi. I <laughs> I printed it off because I, I I prepped. I'd seen this photo. What the fuck is that? So I printed it off. Said, "Mate, you can have a look at this." He said, "What?" So come look at this. Come look at this photo. I I've looked at this CV. So showed him the CV. I'm like, yeah, not bad. It's alright. I looked through it. I said, "Do you want to see the full length photo?" He said, "Yeah." Turned the page over. Full length photo. So this guy. <coughs> He's in, right, so the first one was his dress. He wasn't, he wasn't looking straight at the camera. He was in jeans. He was in military style boots. He was in a polo shirt or something like that, as I recall. He was, he was unshaven, but not like designer stubble. He was scruffy. Yeah, scruffy. Um, that was the first problem. The second problem was he had a putter in his hand as in a golf putter. And the third problem was he was on a crazy golf course. Mid shot. That was, that was, a, <laughs> that was the full length photo he sent in for the job location. Madness. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's one thing, you know, that I, I think, um, I think, I think there's a gap there. That, that not, I, I think I know there's a gap there from people leaving, whatever course they go on, be it close protection, brick lane, architecture. The the and, and I know you do your week long career transition workshop. And mine was quite good, but it's an it's not the same across the board, mm -hmm. and they're missing a trick. Uh, come back to that, but let me tell you about a CV interview job scenario. So that one where the guy was an expert that I mentioned, where he said he was an expert. So. I wasn't involved with the initial CV sift on that job. A colleague of mine said, I've got an interview for this job. Can you come down and interview with me? He didn't, he wasn't involved in the industry. He was just, he was just an associate of this rich person that wanted a bodyguard. And I said, yeah, sure. Can you send me the CVs you've got? He sent me the five of them. I didn't like the look of any of them. And I said, mate, I've got someone here that I know is available. Can I put his CV in? No problem. So our job was to go from six down to two, and we would send two people down to the boss who was going to make the final decision. So, and this is not cap badge orientated because I've been out that long now, I don't care. If you're a good guy or a good girl, you're a good guy and a good girl, regardless of unit or whether you've served or not, as it goes. You want to talk about that later, I don't know. But So the two guys that went down, one was a bootneck and one was an ex power edge bloke. The bootneck CV was awful. Not what he'd done, but his CV, the construction and everything else was awful. But his interview was phenomenal. The best person I've ever interviewed by a country mile. 
he was engaging. He was he was interesting. He, he could, you know, he could he answered all the questions that I had regarding his CV and all the rest of it. So he was a clear. He's going to go down. The Parage guy, really strong CV, mega well constructed. Had done, had more experience than the, than the the, the guy from the the bootneck as it goes. So they were the two that we sent out to see the boss. The boss interviewed uh, the Royal Marine laddie first, and you know he interviewed really well again. So me and Keith were there, and the boss and the, and the, the candidate. He left, and he just said, "Right, well, I want him." He, you know, and I said, "Well, listen, let, let's see the other guy. You know, <clears throat> then you can make an informed decision." And uh, almost had to force him to to sort of re, you know to interview the the other candidate. Interviewed the guy from um, Parage, who interviewed okay, but not a patch on the other lad. Picked up his CV, and a bullet point on his CV read, Army Heavyweight Boxing Champion. And he gave the year, two years in a row. He said, you teach me to box? He goes, yeah, he goes, right, you got the job. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Oh, my God. So it's that one line on your CV that you yeah. just never know. I always mention... Uh, you uh, during the courses as well because uh, I've got people that I have um, I forget what I call them now but um, I run through a scenario of people that have, that have left that have come to the course and they're different um, they're, they're, they're stories and how they've gone and, and I'll say that you know you were I hope I'm right in saying a, a, a horseman uh, you know you could, you, could, rider, yeah. you, you could ride a horse and I said should that go on a CV competent horse rider and people are like oh do not of course it should it absolutely should because if your uh, Russian billionaire has daughters who let you go out on their horse, somebody's going to have to go with them. And if you're the guy that can ride a horse, then it's you. But be be aware, you will get a trade test. Good on a horse, are you here? Yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shows your stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, uh, Brian in his day was a good skier. So competent downhill skier would be something that would go on his CV and so on. So you just never know what that one line is going to get you the job. Mm. But yeah, the boxing thing. Five years he was in that job for. Fucking hell. Filling in the boss. Well, <laughs> dragging, him, dragging him out of shit. There was a reason There was a reason why that guy wanted to learn the box, because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. <laughs> Honestly. Oh. But, um, the career transition workshops, the, the standard is not standard. And the standard is not high enough. What is amongst any organisation now? It's one of those things, department to department, isn't but, it? Well, but yeah, it's all done by <coughs> um, right management. There should be a template for those things. Yeah, but you can't... You, you, there is. But you can't mitigate against the people that deliver it. But you can employ the correct people. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mine, I can't remember her name. She was superb. Uh, was it... Bear with me. She, You're the same lady as me, I think. Heather. Was it Heather? She had um, auburn hair. Was it short? Oh, I can't remember, mate. It was a long was time. Was she short? She, she was. She was quite a, an attractive lady. I seem to remember. Quite attractive. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, nice looking lass. But she, she was. She was on it. Yeah. She was absolutely on it. She was. You know, she was fantastic. Um, but people will come now on resettlement. Just realised the disaster of Heather's listening to that. Like, <laughs> no, no, not this. She was attractive. No, not this. <laughs> In her own way, she was very yeah, attractive. I, I thought you said young. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, sorry. But people are leaving the military and their writing is not good enough, their reading is not good enough, their arithmetic is not good enough, their being a person. They're, no, no, that's wrong. Um, people that aren't managing, there's something I'm getting at the minute is people are, when they're asking for CVs, does the guy or girl own their own house? Yes. Great. Because someone that owns their own house is responsible for the gas bill, the electric bill, the telephone bill, the rates, the upkeep, the maintenance. Then you'll go to someone else's house to do RST or CP and you've got a little bit more respect for things as a house owner than if you're not. So that's being asked? That is being asked. Is this person a house owner? By recruiters? Well, I'm the recruiter, generally. So people are coming to me wealthy people I see, I can see why you'd be asked I can see, I understand it but yeah. I've never heard of it before will you switch that heater off yeah. I, I've never uh, sorry I've never heard it it's, obviously it's like, it's like well why wouldn't you ask that now you say and it. I'll give you an example Yeah. you hear about all these um, empty houses in London that rich people own that no one lives in 
you know, I, our friend Mr. Corbyn's always talking about all these empty houses and, you know, anyway, that's by the by. But um, there will always be somebody in that empty house that a rich person owns and it will be a guy doing security. And the best example of, of, of that, and, a, and a, you know, is the guy a homeowner. This luxurious property had had new flooring laid that people like ourselves could never, ever justify or even afford. And there was a water leak. Because the guy that was in there was a homeowner, when he'd went in there, he'd identified where the water stop cut was. Leak happens straight off. The rich guy that owned it found out what had happened, came down and rewarded him significantly, substantially, for just being a switched on bloke. Mm. So again, yeah, when I'm talking sense. about RST on the course, where's the gas tap? Where's the water stop cut? You know, you need, where's the fuse board? You should know where, it might sound bone, but you should know where all these things are in the house that you're working at, like you will do in the house that you live in. No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mate. Because you stand there and you're, you need some water going, oh, what am I meant to do? Do your job, mate. That's what you're meant yeah, to do. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. You um, you touched on um, it's uh, it's civvies and ex-military earlier. Well, I say that because of the 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 sort of examples I give of uh, during the during our course of people that have they've been through. You know, um, two of the examples I give of people that are have no military background, haven't so much as been in the Girl Guides. And two of the most successful people we've ever put through because they're good people. Mm. Do you need to have a military background to make success in close protection? Absolutely not. Do you need a military background to be a successful close protection officer in Afghanistan? Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But I spoke to one of the guys yesterday who has ever been in the military, currently working in Miami on a, a phenomenal contract that most people with a significant military background could never even dream of doing that job mm. he's got the skills to pull that job off mm. so I'll tell you about that one after mm. I want to put CVs to bed right um mm -hmm. uh because I'm glad we I'm glad we spoke a lot about it because it's I, I think that is one of the biggest fucking headaches and one of the thing one of the biggest initial barriers people see in uh, uh, when they're getting out or oh, is it is it is they, they look at that and it's just it's just a stressor it's a huge stressor mm -hmm. um i mean fr from myself my, my my advice is it's it's always gonna be a work in progress get get to the point where you think yeah i'm happy with that to send off when you revisit it don't be surprised if you think i need i'm gonna change that that is fucking natural just just the case just the case you got to keep it up to date with your experience and your skills and your knowledge and adjust it as you see fit and like you were saying people have a different perspective on it as long as you're being accurate with the, the facts yeah. then, then do it as long as your grammar is correct as long as your spelling and punctuation is correct as long as, it, as long as it prints off fine as well as it looks on the screen for example as long as you've got it in Word and a PDF that's cool um, from what I want to ask you mate is for people listening is what's the best way to approach uh, in terms of resources, knowledge, to get into to producing your first CV, how should it be gone about? Should it be through? So you, I, I, they get their first draft in the CTP, don't they? They do the first yes. CTP, most yeah. of the case. Yeah. Um, and then what? Peers, just fire out to as many peers as as, as you got people. I mean, you know, I, you will write your own CV in the first instance and then you will read in all the mistakes. You will not spot the grammar errors and the bad spell notes. So you've got to send it to somebody. Um, and, you know, and I, I can give my wife huge amounts of credit here because, you know, she she is great at that sort of stuff because she's office-based. So, she, you know, you know, if I think back now, it's laughable, really. But, um, but I was in the same position. The people I'm talking about now that are leaving and, and are poorly prepared, that was me. I didn't have a clue what I was getting out into. And, you know, she looked at my CV and said, listen, this is dreadful. You know, you've got to change this. Um, but, yes, you de you need people that, that you can trust to be, um, you know, critical but, um, but not go overboard. I'm not saying it just because we do it, but training providers have a responsibility. They're taking people's money. They have a responsibility to look at that sort of thing for them. I honestly believe that. 
Yeah. Um, I also think that the command structure should have a look before they leave. Uh, the, uh, the unit? Yeah. The platoon commander should set aside some time to say, I, people don't even get testimonials anymore, or they write their own. I, I know what happens. But I do not believe that the 23-year-old platoon commander, is that about right? Mm. I do not believe that the 23, 23-year-old platoon commander is too busy to have a look at the one guy that leaves his um, his uh, platoon, you know, one every two months to, to have a look at his CV. He's been through Sandhurst, he's educated, he's got a degree. It's never going to happen, no. It won't ever happen. It won't, unless... It won't, mate. But because, because, you know... That should be down to their duty of care, though, before they sign that soldier off, so you go for your final medical? Yeah. It should be along the same lines, because... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. what because All this does is it causes a greater problem. So people leave the military, where they can spend all their money in the first day of, of pay every month. They're still clothed, they're still housed, they're still fed. So then you, you send your soldier out... Into Civ Div, completely unprepared, he then becomes homeless. He then becomes a burden on society. And mm-hmm. that might sound harsh, but that's that's the case. Mm-hmm. You, you end up in hospital, which costs us money and so on and so mm-hmm. forth. So these the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen, there, there should be a, ma- a more robust fit to leave program. So I spoke to a chap today to give an example of, of what I'm on about, who was not uh, English wasn't his first language. Can I come on your course? You absolutely can, but you have to you have to satisfy these conditions, and the conditions are that you can read and write English to a satisfactory level. In order for me to assess that, I'm going to send you something, and you might get someone else to do that. But when you arrive at our course on day one, you're going to do it again in front of me. Yeah. So that is that the SIA say you know you must be able to read, write, and speak English to a certain level. And the, the military should have a system in process where they sign that soldier off. He's fit to leave. Yeah. Has, that, has that soldier got any debt? Should not be allowed to leave with bad debt. Dreadful. Good debt is a mortgage. Bad debt is a jag you're paying 400, 500, 600 pound a month for. We've had people come in the course and I've been like, ah, man, that's a lovely car. Yeah, thanks. You got a house? No. But 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 if 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 that's I don't know unsustainable that. debt, sh- you should not be allowed to sign off if you've got unsustainable debt. But why should you be allowed to leave any organisation then with unsustainable debt? Why is it different for the military? Well, I think I think the military is part of the system, isn't it? So if you were to leave a job for a blue chip company and you've got unsustainable debt or, or you know debt that you just can't manage, that is not the system's responsibility, but the military. We are, they are part of the system. That's part of the government, isn't it? So if it all goes wrong for them, the, the government, in another sense, is going to end up looking after them, aren't they? NHS, then? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a reasonable point, that, and, you know, I, I guess I've never... I know what you're saying. You're coming from the angle that, look, it's a fucking military. Look what they sacrifice. We sacrifice, right? Is that, that's so... So... Give special privilege to the military. I That is... Mate, you know, do you still have to give 12 months to sign off? Say again. Do you still have to give 12 months in order to sign oh, off? I think so. I don't know. So throughout that 12-month period, um, you know, let's get you in a debt management program. You earn this much, you owe that much. You know, I, I did that off my own back. But this all boils that's down point, to... Actually, that's a good point. That is, yeah, they should do that as part of the resettlement. As are in you, that, yeah, the financial advice. Yeah, don't do any financial that's advice. Dreadful, mate. So I had a house when I joined the army. Before I left, I sold it because I knew I needed to be financially robust <clears throat> to survive out there. But this leads me on to the sort of person that joins the military. There is a, I, I, I've never looked at studies now, but these, these are observations that I've made over running courses for the last 10 years. There, there, there is a, a sort of person that joins the military and that person has perhaps not had you know, the um, a constructive home background. So he enters it a little bit unprepared and he leaves less prepared. Hmm. And I just don't think it's right. We're creating massive problems by not ensuring that people are fit to leave. Yeah, I agree, yeah. The, the, the financial is a, that, yeah, you, they, should, they should definitely do that. 
yeah, um, that'd be easy to implement. Yeah, look, what's your incomings outgoings? What's your bills? Be honest, yeah. and we can help you out. Well, you don't even have to be honest. You know, you can get the guys to do an experience check, and it and it all comes up. So if I'm in, if I'm facilitating employment for someone now, do they have to do a financial uh, audit? Absolutely, because would you employ someone in a rich man's household for someone that's got bad debt? Mm. No. Mm-hmm. So I just think we could avert a lot of these problems, and then, and again, there'll be there'll be someone out there that can give a counter argument, I'm sure. But you you get someone that leaves with bad debt, they then start to gamble, to try and. There's an argument against the bad debt, though. The the other argument, the, I mean, the opposite to that is well, with someone with bad debt, uh, you could argue that depending on, on the kind of person they are, is they are more they are more willing, more keen, and need to earn the money to, to pay off the bad debt. So they're going to work harder than your average Joe who hasn't got any debt, for example. Maybe. I mean, because, you know, you can get, like, I mean, for myself, I've got debt, you know, and, and, yeah, and, and it was generated when I was a different person to who I am now. Mm. Um, I, I see what you're saying. There's, there's, two, there's two sides to it, yeah, yeah. But then, again, you know, that person then gets in a, it's a downward spiral and they start alcohol abuse. Yeah. Where, where does it all end? And then we have, obviously, the, the touchy subject. It, of, ends um, po- it ends at a podcast. It ends at a podcast. <laughs> But you know, there's. I just, I just don't think that the military does enough. I don't think there's enough checks and balances on people leaving. I agree with you. I'd never thought the financial side of things. And I, yeah, absolutely. I hundred percent agree with you. I mean, um, Brian and I were talking earlier about uh, the recruitment side of things as well. The, the recruitment and retention side of things. Um, uh, I mean. It's interesting you you talking about what kind of you know the what you perceive to be the kind of people who, who join up uh, might be obviously might be slightly skewed given given what the industry you you train, but also the kind of people uh, yeah. who leave at the point where they need another career. Kind yeah, of, kind of, you know. Um, the, and with the, we we spoke about the the latest recruitment campaign mm. by the army. Mm-hmm. And I initially I was like, oh God, you know, cringy, a bit cringy. And then uh, and a few colleagues, not colleagues, friends, ex-military friends, of fucking hell. Well, I mean, one of them is just going mental about how embarrassing it is. <coughs> and I wasn't sure. I don't like forming an opinion on something if I haven't thought about it, you know, yeah. um, properly. And I thought about it on the way up here on the drive up this morning. And... I was, I was thinking, well, is it such a bad thing? What's bad about appealing to snowflakes? Uh, and I'm in inverted commas. Uh, and when I thought about it, I thought, well, well, what kind of person was I when I joined? I was, I was an absolute fanny. I, you know, really low self confidence, really low self esteem. All I had going for me was fitness. Mm. That was it. And um, I mean, I didn't join up because I got military in the family. I'm, was, I'm the only one, apart from a great uncle in the Second World War, I think. Um, it was kind of like prove myself to myself kind of thing somehow. But plus, I had no other option, really. I, you know, I, I dropped out of college. Um, I was a snowflake of sorts, but back then, absolutely. I haven't turned out too bad, I don't think. You know, it yeah. 100% changed for the better. It took a while when I was in mind. It took, mm-hmm. or it took up to the first Afghan tour, after the first Afghan tour. I, think I, I improved over time, as in personally me over time. And I remember, like, oh, I remember the way I used to think, oh, two, oh, three, oh, four, my early stages, early, early years of my career. I remember thinking, I, I was not confident even was in, you know, in wretch. You, you all are training, you, you pass P company, and you go and do, I mean, I'd done, even after, like, going out and doing Iraq, yeah, nothing much happened, but doing the op- operations and stuff and working. And still, I was not a confident individual. Um, and then over time, it changed. Uh, and so going back to the Army's recruitment campaign, I, I, did, I said it to Bray. Uh, look, get again inverted commas because well, no, fuck it. I'm saying snowflakes. Get there is benefit to be had from getting snowflakes into the military. One, you get them in; it's gonna help them. Not that they need the help, okay? But I do think that um, that if everyone could experience, uh, uh, just say like even just four or five months of military training, it would benefit you. You, you it's an experience at very minimum. It's experience that that you will you gain from you learn more about yourself from the hardships you go through mentally and physically two if these are kind of the people everyone's whinging about uh, think they're entitled to this that and the other always whinging about all sorts of stuff well it'll improve society because they'll realise actually I can stand on my own two feet and I'm to blame for a lot of the things 
I'm not entitled. It's not everyone else's fault. Mm-hmm. It's my fault. I can change you. I can change my life outlook, my outlook in life. I can change my, uh, my the potential I have, as opposed to sitting your whinging and get off my ass and do something about it. You know, and, and learn camaraderie, learn teamwork, learn, like I said, your physical and mental capabilities. Um, So yeah, I don't know. What do you th- I, what, what do you think about it? What do you think? I mean, I, I I I can see how people are getting pissed off about it. it's embarrassing. But but it, you, that's thinking that that campaign is oh, fuck, that's embarrassing because you're painting the snowflakes. Well, hang on a minute. That, that that's that would mean you think that what all the previous campaigns have been targeting the uber ninjas of Civvy Street. You know, the eighteen year old flipping mega fit, mega active, hard as nails guy. You want to get in, into the military? No. Not at all. The previous campaigns target everyone. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's different triggers that make people join the military. I've seen the adverts and... Uh, I've not seen the ads yet, I've only seen the, the posters. The posters, sorry, yeah, that's all I've seen. Um, I, I don't really I don't really have a massive problem with it. I, I think you'd like to think that um, if... So a person goes along, they decide to join, you'd like to think that the recruitment process would weed them out if they remain unsuitable. Yep. So that that's the way that I would look at that. Yep. Ultimately, you know, society has changed from when I joined, is change, is will continue to change if we need to we need to change with it. Otherwise you'll struggle to recruit. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm, yeah, I, yeah well, I, you know. we're getting softer. We are, but but also, you know, warfare is going more technical, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, so it's. I don't have a major problem with the posters I've seen. I can see why the old and bold would. It was different. Was it better? Probably not. But a recruitment poster didn't make me join. Mm, mm. You know, I know exactly what made me join, and it wasn't a recruitment poster. You know. So. What was it? Well, it was the Falklands War. Oh. So in 1982, I was eight years old, and the school I was at paid special interest to the Falklands War because one of our teachers had recently retired and moved down there. Like weeks to be- the Falklands. To the Falklands oh. weeks before it kicked off. And uh, so the, it was just special interest. And um, have you ever seen the picture of a Power Edge bloke drinking a bottle of vodka or a bottle of gin at the end of the war? Uh, I don't think so. His name's was Hank Hood. I know the name. Right he, and he, he unfortunately he committed suicide a, a couple of years back. Yeah. But the Falklands War, and I, I'll never forget that picture of him. And I met him in Blackpool at one of the reunions a few years ago. And do you know Nog? Nog Gorman? Yeah, yeah Nog. Yeah, yeah. Nog introduced me. He said, This is Hank Hood. I goes, You, oh, I had you in Power Ridge. <laughs> but it was just seeing those images at oh, that time. Oh, I remember time. the image now. Yeah, it's yeah. There. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's got uh, the black and eye gloves yeah. on or something like that. And I, ju- I just remember seeing all those images and, and the, the Goose Green and the Mount Longdon and. That was it. From being eight years old, I was joining Power Reg because of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was me sold. There was n- never going to be anything else. And, and f- curiously enough, you know, I'd actually broken, um, I'd broken uh, both my collarbones and I couldn't get in on a medical. And I had to go down to uh, to London for a medical and uh, had to fight tooth and nail to get in because I'd broken both my collarbones. And I said, you'll never do that. So, you got it. I got Argentine family. Have I told you this before? I've heard that something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've got a, my, my uncle. So my mother's Irish, as in air, uh, air. Um, from where's she from? Kildare, where's she from? Uh, my dad's uh, Scottish. Um, I don't know, my dad's irrelevant. But yeah, so my mum's brother moved out there. He, he went out there to become a priest. <laughs> Uh, I think a priest, Catholic priest. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, met a, met an Argentine lady, and um, we got cousins out there. Right, twice out there. So um, I saw them at Christmas. Two of them came over at Christmas. Mm-hmm. You want to rile them up? I mean, they're, they're too young to remember that. I mean, they're younger than me. I was born the year before the Falklands, and they're five, six, seven years younger than me. And um, but you speak, do you speak to? You can't. They take me, I, I, they know I'm a fucking wind-up merchant. So they'll, they'll take it, you know, uh, there's a, a joke about Malvina's fault. Mm. And I, I will always do it, but there's only, I'll only, there's only so far I'll take it. Because, um, fuck me, I, 
it's surprising how strongly they feel about it, given their generation. You know, six, seven years younger than me. It's like fucking hell. Let, let it go. Mm. And there's no, there's no, there's no reasoning with them either. You know, it wasn't theirs in the start. You know, it's ours now. Yeah, we can't blame us that you lost it. You know, it's not, because we didn't take it off you. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't take it off them. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's flipping. It, but there's no reasoning with it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, it's interesting. Hate the Americans as well. Really? Oh, I, I went out to, one of them, I uh, was uh, in uni in Poland, and I went out to, early last year, I went out, she was out there for six months, I went out to visit, I've never been to Poland, I went out to visit, I stayed there for four days, walked into the bar, and there was a couple of blatantly non-Polish people, you know, just mm. by the way they dressed, and the way they were chatting, and the accent, it was American accent, started chatting with them at the bar, and uh, she was behind me, and he was there, she heard the accent, she was mildly drunk, grabbed me on the shoulder, what? Fuck you talking to him for? What, what do you mean? I said, fuck you talking to him for? I said, what? You're fucking American. I said, he's a soldier too. She's fucking her. I think mm. you. <laughs> hey, hey, I, don't know. I didn't, I hadn't realised. Hate them. Hate the USA. Hate them, mate. Mad. Mad. South America is a crazy, crazy place. Mm-hmm. Crazy place. Have you done much work out there? No, but we've got something where we may be <clears throat> supplying people to go there. Mm. Just a few people, but yeah. That might be interesting. Country. Well, I had a message about it earlier today, so yeah. What um what is uh what's on the cards for Argus Europe? Did oh Brian... mate, what are you gonna do when Brian steps away? Well, I mean, you know it's uh did, did he mention it? Uh, that's not yes, that's not to insinuate that you can't stand on your own two feet. <laughs> no, no. I mean listen, it's you know, uh it's uh I knew it was coming and uh you know, we've been working together for for 15 years and you know we've had a good relationship obviously through that time there's been times where you you know you have a little bit chew with each other because that's just natural uh you know we spend 20 odd days a month together um but on the whole we've had a good relationship um i'm not you know i'm not pleased he's leaving um what I've said to him is like I'm 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 looking at it in a positive way and and I've got to. It's hard what I'm not gonna get is like for like, it's hard to replace Brian. I'm not gonna get that relationship with someone who also brings the skill set. I'm hoping that he's gonna remain on a part-time basis to to fulfil a certain criteria, a certain element of the course that I don't want to have to look elsewhere for. But I understand his reasons, his time of life for wanting to step away and reduce um his commitment to work. So I totally get that. So, I'm not over the moon about it. I'm not like, yeah, he's leaving, because we've had a good relationship. Um, but you, you've just got to be positive about it. And my intentions are to make it a little bit of a cooperative. So, the guys, I met some great guys through the courses, and um, I've been speaking to a few of them recently. I've made them aware of you know Brian's intentions and you know the, the sort of time frame and what's happening. And um, I've given them my vision of, of, of things and, you know, what I'd like to do and uh, would, they, would they like to come on board. And the way I view it is, we, you know, we just have uh, honesty, transparency. Someone comes in with a good idea. I acknowledge that it's their idea. Um, we, we, we go legal so that that person that brings in that good idea is the, is the majority beneficiary of that idea, if you like. And then if Argus Europe is the platform to take it forward, everyone's a winner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that is because I can't do everything myself, you know, or I'll burn out. I've sort of been, I've hovered on the edge of burnout a few times and, uh, you know, it's not great. And um, so I, I just, I just want to take advantage of some of the good people that I've met and I want them to benefit from, from what's been created. Yeah. You're lucky, mate. Uh, I, I think, wait, no, you're not lucky. You're, you um the when I say you I mean I mean Argus you and and you know you and Bright in that uh, I I think you're you're the opportunities and those good relationships and good people that you know are a result of the, the own the work that you put in over the years I mean you know that better than anyone in, in the, you know you, you pay and you get it back it can take fucking ages at some point and it can manifest in certain ways you don't even realize until you know years later but I would imagine. Because of the way the, the you know you, you run the company, you run the courses, the kind of people, you, or the kind of person you are, surprisingly, the kind of person you are, mate. Like people who fucking leap at the chance to work with you. 
Yeah. Everyone's yeah. been positive so far. The right people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, everyone's been positive so far. Um, I've had to, you know, obviously, with, with, we are drawing down this year to a course every other month, which I've had to do. I can't go on every month. It's just, it's too much in terms of the post-course stuff. And um, so I've had to, you know, I just said, listen, we, we have to draw down here. I'm going to, my head's going to pop. Uh, and I think that'll be beneficial because that will allow me to work on the business as opposed to in the business. Because you just end up, we finish a course on a Friday, we have the weekend off, then we're back in for a couple of days the next week and then we're going again. And it's too much. Um, and I, I've had loads of opportunities that have come come to me and, and come to all of us that I've never really been to see through because I just haven't had the time. Um, we've got one bubbling away at the moment. There was a meeting happened in uh, on the south coast today. He that guy is uh, coming back up. Uh, he's from the northwest. He he's not an Argosa, but he come to us. He said, "Listen, I've heard about you guys. I've got, I've got something here. I need a vehicle. I think Argus is the right vehicle to take it forward on." I went and met him. We went legal street. We signed an NDA straight away. Uh, one of the August guys, a guy called Martin, he's going to meet with him on Monday to get a debrief from the meeting and, 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 and Martin will head that up and we'll either it'll either have legs and we'll take it forward or we'll say, it's not going to work, let's move on to the next thing. So that's what I want. I, I want a, a core group of good people that are keen to take business forward and um, and, and just and work hard, be honest. Mm. Honesty is the biggest thing, isn't it? Yeah, be, be genuine, you yeah. know. And not just outward, mate, to yourself. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, we're going to start wrapping it up. Is there um, shameless plug, mate? Anything you, you you haven't mentioned you want to mention? Anyone, anything, any whatever? Any um, any snippets of advice you want to get across? Wrote a book with uh, a guy who did the course a few years ago called Mark Thompson, the Service Leavers Guide. Ah, yes. Um, yes, yes. We are going to update it. Okay. Um, it, it was free. Oh, was it? Maybe it had a charge, but it was it was all donated to charity. I think we gave the money to Safa or something like that. We're going to update that. Is it self-published? Yeah. That create space. Uh, uh, can't remember. It was, it was a while ago uh, now. Through Amazon, right? Uh, not Amazon. Uh, through, uh, the Amazon, yeah. Yeah, through Amazon. Yeah, so yeah. we're going to do that again. Um, we'll give it away. There'll be no, there'll be no cost attached to it. Yeah, just we, double check that one. We we have a, like, I think it was two ninety nine. I think it was because because I'm this this time it. we'll give it away if we, if we possibly can anyway. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We did ask the ALC if they wanted it, but no one took us up on it for <laughs> like, for now. You know, but anyway. Um. So yeah, I stand by for that. Um, and I think whether people come on our course or someone else's course, it actually doesn't matter to me. Which sounds really odd, but like people should go the best place for them, and it might not be us. But I'm always happy to take a phone call and discuss things with people. Yeah, and give them uh, my opinion. Yeah, I may to, to be fair, I, I've, all, I've all, you know, I have, I have always said that. Look, um, and, and unfortunately, it probably puts more 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 time in your plate. But it's that you are one of a, a, a small number of people from you know from other organisations, not just CP, but say, look, give him a call because he will. If he's got the time, no, I say te- with you, I say text him first. <laughs> <laughs> and then I warn you off, and it's give him a call, and he'll get something out. You know, he'll, he'll be honest with you. He'll be honest at the court, which is uh, again when we spoke about at the start. You know, he, you want to come down and leave his link and talk to people again out, not to push the company, but to give him your own. Look, this is this is yeah, what exactly. I think. You know, it's it's. Uh, I've been in their position. <clears throat> it's daunting. It's potentially really risky, but it's also potentially really rewarding. The work side of what we do and the courses, I don't regard it as work. I love doing it. I love doing it. How I make a living, I love it. If I won the lottery tomorrow, I'd continue. Mm. I would change things around. I would make changes, but I would continue doing because I love what I do. I never consider any job I go on a chore. I never chunter. I love it. Mm. Cool. Uh, Argus Europe, look at the UK. Sweet. That's it. Cheers, mate. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. Yeah, awesome.